Are you ready to explore how people coordinate to build and empower your community to take action and solve problems to coordinate without any central authority? What? Bring in the OGs of the pre-crypto decentralized coordination space together with the pioneers of the cutting edge technologies to fuse their ancient knowledge with the latest tools in order to fight coordination failures, slay Malak and continue the endless search for the holy grails of decentralized coordination. Welcome to the front lines of coordination. Fuck. My brain is already melting. I hope you survive. Welcome, Spencer. Thanks, Peith. Good to be here. How are you doing, man? Doing pretty well. Uh, pretty busy, but I, I think that's pretty much like like everybody is in this space. <laughs> it's like a, a constant thing that I, I try to remember and I try to be conscious of is that I just really enjoy this, like working in this space. Like being busy doesn't feel like being busy when I used to work in like a like a corporation, uh, it's just there's just so much that's more. It, it feels it's just so much better to be <laughs> to be doing to be doing stuff here. So I just always feel like I I, I should be remembering that. <laughs> yeah, busy as ever, but uh, much more enjoyable. Indeed, yeah. Not like uh, soul drenching busy. <laughs> exactly. Yes, soul uh, soul feeding busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but still, there's uh, yeah, I feel there's there's a lot of uh, burning out in the space, pe precisely because of this. Like, oh, I'm gonna work on my own terms, but then your terms are shittier than your bosses because you don't have like uh, laws that prevent you from working <laughs> 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, I was actually I was on a, some other conversation a few days ago, and people were we're talking about being burned out and they're all working on really amazing things. It's not like they were working on boring stuff or kind of crushing, crushing work, but they were all saying how burned out they were, how they wanted to just find a time when they weren't like stressed out with the amount of stuff they had to do. And I was feeling a little bit guilty for not feeling that way. I really shouldn't feel guilty for that, but just relative to, to what they were going through, I feel like at least, especially in the last few months, I felt like really comfortable with the work that I'm doing and kind of the amount that I'm doing. And I realized that after thinking about it a little bit more, that one of the reasons I think that that is the case is that whether it's just by pure luck or whether I've you know, you know, happened to do something intentionally that has worked, I've kind of realized that the work that I do for the most part it's never really something that somebody else is relying on me to do in order for them to do the next thing. So I don't have like hard deadlines that cause stress on like me, but at the same time, I'm able to be working on things that I think are very interesting and seem to be valuable to other people. And I still work with other people as well. So I, I kind of get the you know, social collaborative component alongside all of that and I guess that I just sort of have maybe done a little work to try to create that scenario but also have sort of fallen into a position where that seems to work really well and I, I don't know if that's generalizable to others based on like somebody's got to be doing work that other people are going to immediately rely on that's kind of the nature of a lot of work especially collaborative work but I guess I've been lucky enough to you know find a niche where that isn't the case, and I think that's been a real positive for you know, my psychology and lack of stress or lower stress. You're right. Yeah, not so much urgency, but still the the space in general is so extreme in that regard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And are you workload? Are you have like made like a conscious effort to not like? Uh, work all the time or is like more like come naturally to you i think it does come more naturally to me it, it's an interesting mix and I, I think the like my what you could call like work behavior is very different 
in this space, like when I've been, now that I'm working, like, or I have been working in, in DAOs and stuff full time versus before when it was like very part time and I was working, my full time job was more in like a traditional corporate setting. There, like that <laughs> actually came like relatively easy to me to to manage my workload and, and you know, maybe that's a signal that I wasn't working on the right stuff because I just it was easy for me to say like all right I don't need to do this now. Like in the in a DAO, you you one of the amazing things is that you feel like an owner, you feel like an entrepreneur. There's much more internal motivation to to work on more things and keep pushing on things even past when like normal quote unquote normal work hours. So I definitely I think I, I still work quite a lot, but part of feeling like you own the outcome is and like you're you Part of that feeling is is less of a feeling of that that it's work and more something that you are doing because you, because you want to or because you think you it it has a benefit. It's less challenging to kind of it doesn't feel as much as if I'm like, oh man, I'm working so much, when it feels different than than work. But at the same time, if something is not continuing to grab me, then it's fairly easy for me to kind of let it go and just say maybe I okay I can come back to that tomorrow it's not urgent for today and i'll just kind of press pause and do something else for the rest of the night you're right it makes sense yeah especially what you said about okay when it's not uh, when you're really motivated by the kind of work that you do then it's much harder to burn out even if you're like working uh, so much going back like uh, for our listeners do you want to tell them a bit about yourself before we get into daos yeah sure you know, my background is in like a mix of economics and th thinking a lot about in incentives and structures, uh, but also some, some psychology. And I was trying to express that in my life or work life in a product management role for a while. And I ended up being in doing that in the healthcare industry for a handful of years. And that was before I got into really got into crypto and DAOs and, and Ethereum and stuff. But it was actually that experience in healthcare that really pushed me over the edge, like fully into the vertical rabbit hole, like just straight straight down. Because <laughs> I, I started recognizing, at, at least in the US, how, how broken the healthcare system is. And then slowly realizing as I kind of learned more about how re everything works or more realistically doesn't work, that the reason it's so broken is because individual patients aren't in control of you know, the data and the metadata associated with their health and their and their treatment and their care and, and all of that. So it creates these like silos of, of data that are controlled by, by hospitals, by insurance companies, by other organizations, other corporations. And they're all kind of, whether or not they, they say it out loud, they're all kind of fighting to control your data. And so you don't get the kind of seamless interoperability that and like incentives to to actually make healthy people or to keep people healthy that that you really need in a, in a healthcare system. And I started recognizing that I, as I was learning more about Ethereum kind of in parallel or just crypto in general, that one of the promises is like individual self-sovereign data control. And if we could get to that point, then that would really could really revolutionize healthcare. So I was starting to work a little bit on trying to help with that stuff. And in my job in, in that big giant healthcare corporation I was working in, there were some blockchain work streams and I started helping on those. But eventually it just like none of those worked. And I realized that we're not gonna be able to change this broken system from within. So I started spending more time outside of that. And that's when I really, that's when I found Raid Guild. And that experience was, was amazing. And just just working within that group of people on on projects for clients and internal projects and and things like that, I just kind of felt like I had found a found a home. And then when the opportunity to start contributing to to Dow House came up, I felt like I I could make the switch full time, and I just I quit that other job. And you know, since then, I've been doing a lot of a lot of Dow House things, Ray Guild things, a few other side projects, a few different things here and there. But at this point, I'm primarily working on DAO House stuff. Cool. What kind of things do you do at DAO House? 
Poof. So I, I've <laughs> kind of all over the place. So in, in DAO House, we have, or at least in, in the, the war camp, like core contributors DAO, we have four sub DAOs or circles or work stream working groups or whatever you want to call them. And I play some role, it seems, or to some degree in all of them. So I do some product management stuff as part of the Mage Smiths group and kind of help think through prioritization and some product strategy, quote unquote, and, and some other things. But then I do kind of similar stuff within the like communications and community side of things in with, within the Ranger circle, which is a lot of like thinking about how to communicate what we're doing and why that's unique and interesting and valuable. And, and then also within like our tokenomics and incentives working group called alchemists kind of overlapping with the ranger stuff like how like what is what is it that makes what we're doing valuable and how can that get expressed in terms of in terms of the house token and and the way that we're able to sustain ourselves and continue building and then more recently i've gotten in, more in, involved in like the internal operations and uh, coordination group called paladins and been doing some some work on like contributor compensation structures and, and design of of those kind of programs so yeah kind of kind of all over the place yeah so many different things but yeah i find it's uh pretty challenging when people ask me like what do you do I'm like yeah <laughs> so many different yeah. things yeah but, uh, how did you find raid guild how did i find raid guild i think i'm trying to remember because like it's been a while and there's been so many paths. Oh, you know what it was? So uh, ETH Denver 2020 was like a big turning point for me. That was the first like Ethereum event outside of like local Chicago meetups that I had, that I started going to or that I had ever been to. And I kind of knew one person who had previously introduced me to a, a group that was going to start hacking on what would become ClearFund. And so I met those guys and I really, I had been into quadratic funding and, and that stuff for a bit. And that, and that was really intriguing. And I, their team was already full, but I kind of kept in touch with them and then started helping out after the hackathon. And it was primarily Oren and Tommy who introduced me to, to Raid Guild and started poking around. Actually a hired Raid Guild for Another side project that I was actually the the hack that I worked on at East Denver, and then kind of through that realized how cool it was and, and, and joined up myself. Nice. And what was the hack? That was, or I guess is still a project called Save Die, uh, sort of in hibernation mode right now. But the original idea was is still one that I think is valuable and interesting, which is to combine a an interest bearing kind of flavor of of die the, the one we were originally working on was was c die from compound but it could be a die from ave or like a die vault a die yearn vault or something else similar to that where you're earning some some amount of interest on your die or yield on your die and then combining that token with some type of insurance for for that token so basically in the US, at least we have this concept of like the FDIC insured savings accounts. And I'm sure in other countries, there's an equivalent thing. I don't, I don't know what the, what they're exactly called, but where like up to a hundred thousand dollars or something, you can earn interest on your savings. But then like, if there's a issue with the bank or something, or like a run on the bank, then the, the government will basically pay you what your principal was. And so I would, was hoping to be able to create a, a simple version of that by combining these two existing assets into one and then have that be transferable and, and flexible and kind of a, a Lego for, for other DeFi or other people to, to use. The challenge became, and the reason it's kind of in hibernation is that I fully expect more insurance protocols and, and products to, to be coming out within DeFi, but most of the ones that have been proliferating thus far are focused less on like stable coins and that kind of stuff and more on the more volatile assets like ETH or Uni or, or Link or, or whatever. But uh, you said you still 
you still uh, want to continue working on this at some point? Yeah, so there's a, a, a few of us who have been working on it, and, and we still meet occasionally and kind of reassess whether it makes sense to to pick it back up. But all of us are, are pretty busy with other things, so that's that's another <laughs> another challenge. <laughs> right. Uh, that's kind of the biggest problem with uh, <laughs> all of these uh, cool projects. Like so many great ideas, but so little time. Oh, I know. Yeah. The, uh, so I, I was feeling maybe like five or six months ago, I was feeling like like I had stretched myself too thin across multiple projects for the for that exact problem. Because there's just like so much interesting stuff that I was just, it's so easy to say, oh yeah, I'll, uh, I'll help with that or I'll work on that. That sounds awesome. And before I knew it, I was working on like seven different things and I'm feeling like I couldn't really contribute in any kind of meaningful way to any of them, which was a pretty crappy feeling. So eventually I kind of figured out that what I needed to do was like focus around one big thing and that ended up being ended up being Dow House. And that has like helped helped a lot in terms of how I how I'm able to approach what I'm doing. Right. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like in theory we could all be working for so many different projects, but then like if you really want to be effective and not stretch yourself too thin, really yeah, focusing on maybe like two two projects maximum. Or like Maybe a few, but let, yeah, mainly mainly two or three. Then having a few that maybe you do something occasionally for. Yeah, I, it's definitely important to like not just be focused on one thing because of the like. There's so much value in like connection and community, and also like interoperability and composability. So it's good to have some variety and some connections with other projects. But yeah, I, I found that like one or two big big ones to focus on is, has been pretty helpful. I think a lot of people don't even uh, think enough about uh, the commitments that they're getting themselves into because you get so excited about this uh, cool new project and you want to help and then like there are other projects and then soon you're like <laughs> in over your head. <laughs> yeah, commitment is a good word because commitments can be can be tacit if you like start to to contribute to multiple things. And then some people will like follow through on those commitments, but then like take on way too much and like get get burned out and feel stretched too thin. Uh, but then other people might just like start start dropping dropping the ball on other things, and that's no good for anybody, obviously. So actually, one of the things that some of the work that we've been doing in, within Dow House for for contributor compensation is trying to think about how we can make commitments more explicit and make it easier for our contributors to think about what those commitments are that they're making and hopefully make it easier for them to work on Dow House and other stuff, but without you know, running into those some of those challenges. And at least for me, that has really helped because I've been able to say like, okay, I am committing to X percent of my time or my effort or my kind of focus on Dow House. And I know that that's, that's what I'm committing to. So it's been made it much easier for me to for example, make decisions about like if I have, I don't know, this is a weird, slightly weird example, but if I have like 15 minutes before a next a next meeting and I am trying to figure out like how I can spend that time. Previously, I was like, okay, which of the seven projects that I'm working on can I do a small task for? Now it's what needs to be done for Dow House. Right. It's kind of a much easier cognitive question. Right. Yeah, I think it's super important to have these like super clear commitments like uh, what are you committing to how much and uh, yeah being clear about it that's what we started doing as well recently like i think about uh, two months ago i wrote we had this like uh, champions ring which is like uh, basically like an accountability circle for the people who are in charge of different uh, initiatives or different domains inside metagame but it was really like, okay, you are in charge. Okay, welcome. <laughs> now we've like have this whole process and this document of like, okay, these are the responsibilities. Like uh, be clear about like write a post about what you want to be doing, how much time you're committing, and like yeah, making a, a whole process of how do people even get uh, accepted. Yeah, I like that. That's really nice. And then on the like regular like one of contributions uh, side, I think. Uh, one powerful feature that uh, 
that I'm really looking forward to is having like people stake on some like high important tasks because like yeah yeah like take a task okay it's important task fucking stake on it <laughs> like we can't afford people taking it and not doing it we've been thinking about similar kind of things in in raid guild cuz we have we have the raid token which is basically just like gives us a ton of opportunities to to play around and experiment with new kind of incentive structures and mechanisms so one thing that we're working on is kind of calling availability and commitment right for starters it's really just commitment so if you have start a new internal project that each member of that team has to stake a certain amount of raid tokens on that and then if they kind of like don't stick around until it's done and like don't do their part then the the other members of the of that team can vote to slash them or penalize them in some way nice yeah well, this this is one of the points in the in the champions look as well but we're not like uh, making it compulsory yet but yeah i think uh, long term it's a good idea to have people at least uh optional like stake something and uh so one to add is like uh force people about to think about this time availabilities so right now on the my meta profiles there's a box that says like uh, what's your time availability like how free you are to take on other work i started thinking about it more in terms of percentages and so like on your profile you also have a memberships section which shows like what DAOs you're a member of like what projects you're a member of i think it would be good to have people like uh, assign percentages okay this is how big of a percentage of my time i can commit to this project how much to this project and how much I'm actually free. Yeah, 100%. One of my hopes is that if more DAOs and, and projects can adopt kind of like a, a commitment style engagement model for their contributors and maybe start compensating them you know, according to how much they're committing, at least in part, then that can like be credible sort of source of how much you're actually committing to different projects. And then that can like a, that can be like a real thing that that you yourself can see and think about and, and make decisions about whether it makes sense for you, but also other people can see you know, what you've actually committed to and maybe where you have time. Mm. Yeah, super valuable. Yeah, you said you, you got involved in this space. You kind of got originally interested because you were in the medical space and that's how you see like crypto improving this. But what do you like so much about DAOs? You've been yeah, super into DAOs. Yeah, I, I've definitely kind of dropped the the healthcare medical focus. Finding the DAO space was really awesome. I guess one one other thing that I was kind of recognizing within that that job in that healthcare corporation was like the the organization itself was totally dysfunctional. Like it couldn't actually do anything because of the way that it was like very hierarchical, and so nobody felt like they actually had like the power to make a certain decision or or, or do something. But then there was also like a lot of horizontal, the ostensible power of the corporation, like that company was that it had a lot of different pieces that it could put together, but like nobody could figure out how to actually make anything happen. So maybe it was against that backdrop where that like finding DAOs and you know, discovering how totally new mode for coordination and collaboration and, and working together, like that seemed really really attractive and then like kind of the more that I worked within it and the more that I understood about how it, it could work and what was interesting and like the more that I got excited about what that could mean and, and how how important this this work is on, on DAO tooling and DAO infrastructure is and it became very clear to me that that's really what I should be focusing on. Right. Makes sense. How do you define a DAO? Like uh how do you draw the line you know because people can have a DAO that's like 10 people have uh, all the token supply and make all the decisions and just again there's no hierarchy but there are a few people making all the decisions and uh, like how do you, how can you tell like what's a DAO what's not a DAO and like what even is a DAO <laughs> yeah I actually have been working on trying to find a a good legitimate answer to that question. I've got a got an article in the works that I'm going to hopefully be publishing soon that I think introduces a way to think about it in a from a like a first principles kind of perspective. I'm hoping we'll be able to help answer 
answer that question in a, in a way that's satisfactory to, to a lot of people. The thing that really helped me figure out how to think about it was in DAOs, we think a lot about decentralization. It's in the name, but decentralization, and you kind of hear this a lot, is more like a means to an end. It's not like the, the end on its own. It's not the, the goal on its own. And I, I kind of realized that the thing that DAOs are really great at is, or what like makes them so different from more traditional organizations is that they are resistant to capture. So like their coordination mechanisms and also sort of the, the assets that they hold or the resources that they control, they're not really capturable by bad actors, whether from like internally, like a some executive sort of embezzling money from their company or like some person on the on the board or some somebody like taking bribes and, and pushing decisions in a certain way because they have the power to or externally like like a government changing a law and like totally screwing over a a company that was that existed based on an assumption that the laws would work a certain way or actually probably a better example is like a company built on or an organization that was relying on some API from Twitter or some APIs from Facebook or something. And then Twitter or Facebook just decided that they want to build that for themselves and, and take all the profits. And then they just close down the API. DAOs are really great at preventing that kind of thing. I think if we, if we use that frame, like if we frame things that way, then we can have a better sense of, of what is closer to being a DAO and what is farther from being a DAO. And the like multi-sig executive council controlling everything is better than a, a corporation with like one CEO controlling everything, but it's still not as close to, there's still plenty of opportunity for a bad actor, either who's already on like the executive council or who is like trying to bribe the executive council or something. There's still a lot of attack vectors there and a lot of risk of capture and, and kind of issues relating to that. So I don't really think that those like token multi-sig snapshot structures are best thought of of DAOs. I, I think they're they're interesting on the, in their own right and there's a lot of cool things that they're able to do, but I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to label them DAOs, especially compared to other, other structures that we have. Right, and would you say that the a DAO needs to have, like, needs to run on a, like, an actual DAO framework, like a DAO house or whatever other uh, DAO framework, just not be, like, a centralized as a multi-sig or not? Probably. I, I don't want to say definitely. One structure that I have been starting to get intrigued about is, like, what if you had the same multi-sig snapshot token setup that a lot of communities have right now, but it, you just like, kept that, but you were able to say basically that, or all of the token holders can kick out any of the, any of the signers at any time. So like that would get a lot closer to, to what we're looking for, I think. Um, and the, the way I've been trying to think about it is like, who is delegating to who are the token holders delegating like some power to the multi-sig signers or are the multi-sig signers delegating decision-making to uh, to the token holders? Whoever is delegating is the one that actually has the real power. Right. And would you say this would have to be like programmed in some way or can just be like part of the like social structure that people can be replaced from the multi-sig or whatever? I think the social structure can work to a degree, but like that can be captured by somebody who is like skilled at navigating it. Not really a fan of that snapshot multi-sig token setup, not, not necessarily because it can't work. And I think we've seen a lot of examples of it working pretty well, at least thus far. But if that kind of becomes the standard and if like people understand that as the thing that works, then we're kind of giving up a whole lot of, lot of stuff that's really interesting and really promising. Like, the reason those work or those tend to work is because the people who are on the multi-sig and the people who founded them are like known quantities and trusted and have reputations to uphold. And what that means is that people who don't have a lot of experience or a high like pedigree or 
a reputation, an existing reputation, including a lot of anonymous or pseudonymous people, they don't really have the opportunity to start projects like that um, unless they put in a lot of work beforehand, like building up a reputation. And I think it would be really awesome if, if, if like anybody could start a DAO and if the idea and the core concepts are interesting enough, lots of people would, would feel very comfortable getting involved without the risk of that one or two or three founding team, even if they're completely anonymous, like just running away. So I would like to see us pushing towards structures and mechanisms that don't require that kind of like social trust and like cultural cultural rules. The cultural culture stuff is really awesome and important and interesting, but in the long run, I don't think it's enough. Uh, and we need to embed the cultural values into the technology that, we, that we're using. Right, yeah, I absolutely agree. I like the, I don't know what is, what is it called, but uh, you know, there's now a way to control a multi-sig via the house voting. Somebody told me that recently. Oh yeah, so the, the Zodiac stuff from, from Gnosis is really cool because it, it opens up a whole bunch of possibilities to use a, basically use a, a Gnosis safe as like just a generic account. And then you can like swap in or out the governance mechanisms for that account. One example of that is with a Moloch DAO via DAO house. You can have the DAO controlling, it's via the, the minion technology right now. You can have a DAO controlling the, the safe without any signers on it. That enables some pretty cool stuff. Very cool. Uh, yeah, we are unfortunately still on Aragon because when we when we were launching the DAO, there was no like no possibility to mint tokens inside DAO house. And uh, after that, we kind of uh, moved the the minting uh, the minting ability from the Aragon DAO to the multisig because we bridged the token to Polygon. So like having the needing uh, the tokens to vote for the minting was not good. But yeah, like uh, in our case, so we have uh, the token that's actually not used for governance. The big decisions that like affect the whole community are actually done in a democratic way. So one person, one vote. And then like uh, different uh, teams are autonomous, like they, are, they can make decisions that are in regards to their part of the project without like needing to put up to vote everything and then the token voting was really used only for minting and now the multi-sig is used only for minting so like in one way you could say that we are more of a decentralized organization than a lot of DAOs that like default Aragon DAO that's like completely governed by tokens but then as you said on the other hand like it's a multi-sig, so is it a DAO? And then there's this whole like difference uh, that people are kind of conflating the DAOs and uh, like decentralized organizations in an old sense. Hard to <laughs> reconcile all of these things. Yeah, I, I think what has helped me kind of think through those kind of things has been like w what really matters. So like the back to the capture stuff or like capture resistance is like, what really matters is the, if, if something is captured, the problem is that the resources that it controls are also captured. So like that's the, that's the reason to, if you're a bad actor, the reason to capture something is because you get, you can basically steal the assets from that thing. Sometimes if you capture the actual governance mechanisms, you can steal like the take off the top of the assets for like a super long time because you control the way things work. But sometimes you just like take what's from the pot and leave. So you don't really need a DAO, like you don't need a DAO if you don't have any like assets or resources that are you're trying to control from the organization. If every individual just like has their own assets that they're kind of like throwing in or they're like doing things in a collective way with, then you don't really need a DAO. Or like another angle on it is like if if a certain asset or a certain resource like isn't that crucial to the organization, then it's like not that bad if it's controlled by even a single person or like a executive council on a on a multi sig. So if the if the token isn't like isn't the coordination mechanism, isn't the governance mechanism, then it's not really the end of the world if that like 
that multi-sig gets captured because the bulk of the governance is happening elsewhere via the, the Aragon DAO, right? So separating those concerns is, is really helpful. Yeah, that's a great point. Like different levels of like centralization or decentralization based on how much specific pieces of organization actually matter. <laughs> and like also in our case, we are now that we are uh, fundraising, we are launching a new DAO that's going to be specifically just for fundraising. So we will gather the for either from the interested people inside the DAO and then on a monthly basis make the proposal to the DAO to take Ether out, do a seed buyback and put the pool token back inside the DAO. So in that case, we also have that DAO. And so it's also a question of like, do projects, like do we have DAOs or are we DAOs? <laughs> to get more, even more philosophical. Right, right. Yeah, and I guess like, I think it's, it can be helpful to think about the like, the umbrella as a DAO and then the, the the individual pieces also as DAOs, but like more like sub DAOs or something. I, I don't think it's really necessary to try to find exactly where the ex specific boundaries of an organization or a network are. But to some degree, that's kind of impossible, especially in a more decentralized setting or distributed setting. But like for ease of conversation like, i think it's totally reasonable to call the umbrella like group organ or organization or network i think it's reasonable to call that like the dao and then everything else sort of a a subset of that it's a good point and uh, the final tricky part i guess is like when defining the dao like yeah the, when defining a dao what is the decentralized part like what is the what is actually decentralized? Like, is it uh, the decision-making part, or is it like the just the fact that the project is on a blockchain, so it's like the architecture is decentralized, and uh, like yeah, figuring out this whole uh, degree of like how centralized the decision-making can be for the DAO to still be considered uh, decentralized. I actually think that decision making is not what needs to be decentralized. I think one thing that that DAOs do a really interesting job of is like separating the powers of decision making and the powers of of and like executive power. So like if you think about and this is kind of part of the coming from that article that I've been working on if you think about taking some kind of action say like spending some money, there's like, multiple phases involved. And one of those phases is like deciding what to spend the money on. And then only once that phase is kind of complete, do you actually spend the money? And so it's that last phase that's like executing on the act, like executing the, the thing. It's like actually doing the action. And in a DAO, I think it's possible to have different powers or different people associated with each phase. So what's really the most important thing is to have decentralized executive power, basically the power to spend the money, basically. If you have that like you would in like an Aragon DAO or a, a Moloch DAO or compound governor or where like the votes on the thing actually execute the action, then you can you can delegate the decision-making part to the people who are best equipped to do that. Like they will come to a decision and then maybe they will sort of, I, what happens often in Moloch DAOs is they will just make a proposal and then anybody who cares to can vote yes. Or if you, people who trust that, that person will just don't have, don't have to vote because of the optimistic nature of, of Moloch DAO proposals. Or in an, another example is if like the those that decentralized executive power has delegated some executive power, like a small portion of it to to a, a small group, then then they can go do things. So I think the important thing is, the, or the crucial thing is to decentralize the executive power. And if you're able to do that, then that opens up a pretty large design space of how decisions can actually get made and how things can get done. And I think that's a like a unique property of DAOs, and I 
think there's a, a lot of there's a lot of exploration for the DAO space to do on on how to figure out the best ways to do that or to to use that property. Right. Well said. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you have a like a good way to to know who are the people that should make a decision, like it doesn't like not the whole community has to make a decision. It's the people who have the most expertise, like they are. They write the proposal and then people either like it or don't like it. But yeah, I guess the the main part that bothers me is like in the case of token governed DAOs is like my fear of that in the long term they are like easily captured by obviously people with uh, a lot of money. Like that's uh, not a problem in DAO house because you have to vote on like having people actually accepted and given shares. But uh, with purely token governed, they can just buy and that's it yeah naive token governance is, is super scary for that reason and, and others but yeah like large part of that reason and i'm guessing you have to go but yeah like do we have any any closing thoughts if you got time for the closing thoughts yeah i i don't really closing thoughts i guess just i find all of this stuff like incredibly fascinating and also incredibly important and I, I could probably talk about it for for like a week straight i don't know it's, it's just like i would love to see more people thinking about this stuff and, and and what it means and how to best go about creating these types of organizations and and networks uh, i think a lot of people are but i would love to see more people do that so i guess if i could put out a call to people to like try to get them to do that more i, w I would definitely do that Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your uh, to your article. I think uh, the whole space is kind of uh, wrestling with this question of like, what even is a DAO? Like, we all see the potential, but uh, we're not quite sure yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing it and publishing it and seeing what people think. Thanks for Thanks for having me. On. It was really fun to fun to talk about DAOs and, and all this stuff with you. Yeah. Well, happy to have you, man. All right. Thanks, Pete. Uh, see you around, man. Take care.